Hello, 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 Kelly, hello, I mean, Ke sorry, hello, Kayla, hello, Marina, hello, hey, Ashton, oh, wait, boy, it's been a long time, wait, hello, Kayla, hey, Ashton, hello, Remy, uh, hello, someone else is here, oh, I'm sorry, um, and I just lost my board. Hello, Jake. Hello, Sylvie. Hello, Hello, Professor. Hello, Nicole. Hello, and good afternoon, Sylvie. Awesome. Um, who else? Hello, Abigail. Hello, that's awesome. Uh, hello, Ashley. Did I say Ashley? Oh, and we have. Uh, hello, Jake. Hello. Who I know was here since 1969 or since 421. Anyway, um, I know you were here for a long time. Okay. Um, uh, 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 who else am I not? Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. And good afternoon, my board, which keeps disappearing. Hang on one sec. Okay. It has been a long time. We have much. I've missed you deeply. Apparently, I've not missed you enough to finish your exams. And I really do apologize. For you see, that's a stupid joke. And of course, that's not why I haven't finished them. Um, I don't know about, so some of you, I hope you had a good break. I know that if you're science students, it's distinctly possible that you actually didn't have a break. Uh, that was a, a little bit of my experience. I apologize. I will, I know this semester is drawing to a close soon. I will, oh, wait, did I just admit, wait. So I might've just admitted Sulani to the wrong room. Oh, no, okay. Um, I, and taking your exams here. Unfortunately, I by accident scheduled all my exams to the same time, so I'm very behind on them. But I, I will get them back to you, and I know it's not helpful that you don't have them. Um, wait. And Remy has shared something. Hang on one second. Oh my god! Oh my god! That is bizarrely there. Huh? Huh? That's actually, wow. Okay, so the Remy image that's in the chat is strangely helpful. I mean, that kind of does get at the point, doesn't it? And I do want to get at that stuff today. Um, yes, and I want, <laughs> I've never seen that before and there might be reasons. Um, wow, that's like bizarrely, uh, Correct. I mean, I mean, I, I mean, it, that like actually really does capture the relationship in a surprisingly helpful way. I might have to hold on. I have to download that. I'm sorry. Um, I mean, I've seen a lot of. I mean, it's weird, but I. But there, you know. All right. Anyway, that's good, Remy. Thank you. I'm kind of pleasantly surprised. But uh, why? Okay. 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 Um. I'm more surprised that I've never seen that than any. Okay, and good afternoon, Selady. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Okay, um, so we have to get. So, so we won't be talking about the exams today again. I apologize. I'm going to stop saying that. I just want to make it clear because I know how annoying it is, and I also don't want there to be any uncertainty about it. Um, but you've had at least I think you've had probably two labs since I've last seen you. Um, so I want to start catching up with that material. Um, um, we definitely need to talk about this electricity business. I mean, that is the electricity is sort of the ultimate point of this whole course. I mean, it's the final point. It's the final, it puts everything together. That is certainly my ultimate focus. But before we get to the electricity, let me ask, Did you guys, I, I believe I know the answer, so I'm just making sure. Am I correct that um, of all the labs that you've done that we have not talked about, what I'm trying to say is you, you never did a lab about the Doppler effect. Is that correct? Have you ever talked about the Doppler effect with either? No, that's a no. That's a Jake, no. Okay. No, we didn't. No, okay. And that's fine. I didn't think you had. I just want to make sure. Um. Okay. 
So we have to do that first before I get to all this electricity. There's just no two ways about it. It's often on the final exam and there's a big reason for it. It's important. So I have to, so, so for good or for, oh, and no, thank you, Remy. Okay, so for good or for bad, Okay, just to quickly remind you, since I know it's been a long time since we've been together, to remind you that the whole purpose, the whole framing theme of this course is unthingy things. Un oh, for the note. Oh, yes. Okay, so exactly. Hold on, there's just a minute. The note says thingy things. I just want to remind you, without going too far down the rabbit hole, that the purpose of this whole course is to look at the motion of things through the universe that are not thingy, or the motion of stuff through space and time that is not material or particular or massive or tangible. We're ultimately looking at how, at motions through time and space that involve immaterial entities. The last topic that we were doing before break, at least in lecture, the last topic that we you know, spent all this time building up was, was waves, right? Waves are our first big example. When a wave travels from me to you, that's our first big example of something traveling from me to you that isn't a thing. Right When a wave travels from me to you, such as a sound wave, what's traveling from me to you is information, right? And that, that's why we spent, we spent all this time sort of building up and constructing an understanding of waves because we wanted to see the first concrete example of a motion that is not concrete. That's waves. Now, in, okay, I'm just I'm reminding, I'm just trying to show you how the material is connected in this class, like so it doesn't all seem random to you or whatever. So then, so we were doing waves in lecture before before break and before the exam and all that. Then in lab, of, of course, I'm well aware that in lab, you've moved on to looking at all this electricity, right? And, and that might've seemed to many of you like a left turn, like, I don't know, like where did this all electricity come from? Electricity is the next and sort of final frontier of, of, a, of an even more abstract unthingy thing electricity um whether it involves electric fields which we ultimately want to talk about here in lecture or electrical currents which you're doing in the lab electricity is an example of an unthingy motion in fact in fact let me just add one thing to that comment
just to be clear, I mean, again, to be clear, like why we're suddenly talking about electricity or why you're investigating electricity in the lab and everything is when current flows throughout a circuit, like from a battery through a resistor and back to the battery, what's flowing around the circuit we say is charge, electrical charge, i.e. the stuff that's contained, the property that's contained in electrons, and th that's correct. What's moving around the circuit is charge. But let's be really clear before I go any further. What's moving around the circuit is charge. Charge is a property that's contained in electrons. What I want to make clear is when you look at current going around a circuit, there is, no matter how, there's no individual electron that's actually making the journey all the way around that circuit. Um, it, it's not the trajectory of a particle that you're studying. What You're looking at a wire in the lab. You're looking at wires that have already a huge number of electrons all distributed throughout the wires. Like there isn't like one electron that we're putting in there and sending on a journey. There's bajillions and bajillions of electrons that are already sitting in the wire even before you do anything. They're already there. When you turn on the battery or when you turn on a switch in your circuit, what happens is the, the charge contained by those electrons starts flowing, meaning that an electron over here like vibrates back and forth. And then an electron next to it vibrates back and forth, oscillates back and forth. And then an electron next to it oscillates back and forth. And it's and so what's sent through that row of electrons is a pulse or a flow of charge, just like when I shout at you, there's already a bunch of air in between me and you. And I don't send an air molecule from my mouth to your lips, right? I oscillate a bunch of air over here, which then oscillates a bunch of air over there, which then oscillates a bunch. So what I send to you is a pulse, a wave pulse, through the medium known as air. When you send electrical current through a wire, you're sending a pulse, a, a charge pulse, to the medium known as electron. I just want to make that clear. So that's one enormous connection between one important reason you're studying electrical currents is because that's just another type of information flow. It happens to be smaller, more microscopic. It happens to involve things that are a little bit more abstract, i.e. charge rather than air masses. But so that's why it doesn't come earlier in the course material. But it is yet another example of you studying the flow of information from one location to another rather than the trajectory of a particle from one location to another. So first of all, I just want to make that clear. Um, and, um, why the electrons are exchanging this charge information the way they are, why they're vibrating in the first place is kind of the last topic of the whole course. It's something called a field, which is even more unthingy than a wave. That's what we're trying to get to with all of this is fields. They're our final abstract, our final most immaterial entity that we study in this class. Um, but to get there, I do have to do one final I have to look at one final wave phenomenon with you right now that you have not seen in the lab. I'm going to try to be as quick as I can about it, um, but I don't. But you, should, I'm going to try to be somewhat quick and tidy about it, somewhat. But it, I can't be that quick, and I definitely want you to stop me with any questions at all as I proceed. Um, and I see there's already one in the chat. I'm going to look in the chat in one second, but. So just to be clear where I am, I'm about to show you something new that you haven't seen. It's a little bit of a backtrack. I will look in the chat in one second. I just want to make clear what's about to happen now. We're going to look at this phenomenon called the Doppler effect because we need it um, because it's part of the, um, and if, once I'm done with it, then we'll get back to electricity and all that. Um, but let me just see what's happening in the chat. Sorry, hold on. Oh, 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 what does the note say? Okay, I think I answered that. Okay, okay, I hope, I think. Um, okay, so again, just to be clear, so this Doppler effect thing that I'm about to go over is not from a homework assignment. It's not from the lab. It's just fresh lecture material for good or for bad. I will try, I hope to not just talk at you for two and a half hours, but I, I always say that, I know. Um, 
but uh, and I hope not to do the Doppler effect for two and a half hours. But yeah, uh, so as always, you, once I get going, though, I'm going to lose my head as I always do. So, so you are welcome at any point to put in the chat either a question like "Please slow down, I don't get what you're saying," or you can put in the chat like "This is too. Can we please speed up and you know go to the next thing?" Um, okay, so here's what the Doppler effect is. Okay, so first of all, the Doppler effect is, is, is a wave phenomenon, specifically, a strictly a wave phenomenon. The Doppler effect applies to any wave you can imagine and all waves you can imagine, but it does not apply to anything but waves, okay? I haven't yet, I'm about to say what the Doppler effect is, but first I'm gonna tell you what the condition for the Doppler effect. So what this page says, the Doppler effect occurs when the source of a wave and the receiver of a wave travel at different velocities relative to the wave medium. Okay, obviously I'm going to draw a picture and set up a scenario for you, a scenario for you for you here in a moment. But the the idea is if we assume that there's some source of a wave, a transmitter, something sending out a wave, we assume that something is receiving the wave. We assume that if it's a wave. There must be a medium through which the wave is traveling. It's a wave is a set of oscillations of a bunch of particles known as a medium, right? So you, you can't have a wave without a medium. Um, one second. The most common and I think comfortable, straightforward example of a wave to picture whenever we're talking about the Doppler effect is a sound wave, okay? So if you imagine a speaker sending out sound through the medium of air to some receiver or to some ear, right? If you imagine that a speaker is sending out sound to an ear, if the speaker and the ear don't have the same velocity relative to the medium. In other words, if one of them is moving through the air and the other one's sitting still in the air or vice versa, that's the condition for the Doppler effect. So for example, like a motorcycle, like blaring its horn while it drives toward you or away from you or a motorcycle blaring its horn while you run toward it or run away from it. That's the condition for the Doppler. And the result of the Doppler, the effect itself, Oop, I don't know how this got flagged, sorry.
Okay. Maybe, um, let me make a couple of things clear. So first of all, what I'm saying in the Doppler effect, if if I send a wave to you through a medium and one of us is moving relative, one of us is not stationary relative to the medium, then what will happen is you and I will measure two different frequencies for that one in the same wave. We will disagree over the measurement of frequency for that wave. I have to say, I have to emphasize the word measurement. Well, first of all, because we're scientists, right? But I want to emphasize the word measurement because when I'm saying disagreement, I don't mean we're like that. I don't mean we have two different opinions and like one of us is wrong and one of us is right. Or, and I don't mean that that one of us is having a misperception or something like that. I mean, we would make two measure, we would each make a measurement of the frequency for that wave. And each one of our measurements would be correct to us in our frame of reference, but the two measurements won't be the same. They're equally valid, but they're not the same. What this means realistically in the case of sound, okay, with sound waves, it's important to know that the frequency of a sound wave, the, the number of crests per unit time, the number of cycles per second, right, of a sound wave is interpreted by the human brain as high highness or lowness of the note. Like, it, to be really clear, and you should write this in your notes if there's any confusion in your mind at all, I'm saying frequency is not interpreted by the human brain as volume. The, the the frequency of a sound wave is the note of that sound wave, the pitch, the tone, whatever word, strictly speaking, tone, strictly speaking, kind of means something else. But, but basically, <laughs> the frequency of a sound wave is where that sound wave appears, like on a piano keyboard. Let me, in fact, be really specific about that. All right, just to put this in, oh, sorry, uh, in perspective. Wait, I just lost you. Does it, did I just lose you? Wait, okay. Oh, something's in the chat. Wait, sorry, sorry. Oh, good question. Wow. What? And pause for a second, just because. So there's a question in the chat that said, so, 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 okay. Uh, so what I'm saying is the frequency of the sound wave determines the pitch, the note that we hear. So someone in the, in the chat, so does that mean that angular wave number um, would determine the loudness that we hear? That's a great question. And it totally shows I, that would make sense. And that does show whoever's asking that is obviously, first of all, paying attention to what I'm saying now, which I appreciate, but also it's showing that they're connecting like other aspects of the, the course material, which I appreciate now that, but the answer happens to be no, like right, get good guess, right on the right track. It happens that loudness or volume is determined by the wave amplitude. I mean, which would have been your next guess, presumably if I like gave you enough time, like, so it's totally the right track, totally the right thinking. It just happens not to be the case. And it, there's ultimately a reason that I could explain, but maybe not worth explaining right now. Um, but so, but so amplitude, of the wave, of the sound wave, ultimately determines the energy of the wave, which ultimately means the loudness of the wave, of the sound wave. But the frequency ultimately determines, so great question though, again, anyway, the, 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 but 
the frequency of the sound wave determines pitch. And I know that everybody, and I, again, this is another rabbit hole. I don't, I'll try not to go down, but when I say determines, I mean very strictly mathematically. I don't mean this just sort of like loosely and approximately. I mean, if you've ever, like, I mean, the higher the note that you hear, that means the air molecules are vibrating that much faster. And very specifically, like if you go over to a piano and you press the C, and I know obviously all of us are different, like some of us have had a lot of music lessons in our life and some of us have you know, tried musical instruments and others of us have not, and some of us sing and some of us don't. But I do know in my heart that all of you listen to music. I know that all of you know what I'm talking about. At some level, like you understand, I think what I mean by highness or lowness of pitch Okay, I'm just gonna ask this actually. Just raise your hand if you've ever looked at a piano keyboard. Like if you know what a piano keyboard looks like, even if you can't play. Or Okay, that's okay, two, three. I mean, I'm not trying to be silly, but I'm just making sure. Okay, so if you look at a piano keyboard, like and some, you know, you know there's notes and they're labeled like C, D, E, F, G, A, B. Again, some of you know that like a lot. And some, if you go over to the piano keyboard and you press the middle C, Okay, if it's in tune, if it makes the note that it's supposed to make, what that means is that key is like making a hammer slam down on strings in the piano and the string, if you, if you hit that middle C and the piano's in tune, a string inside the piano will vibrate 256 times per second, like literally. It, and, and then the air will vibrate at 256 times per second, cycles per second. And then your eardrum will vibrate 256 cycles per second. And then your eardrum will send an electrical signal, electrical signal through your brain that will vibrate at 256 cycles per second. It's actually quite extraordinary that a wave will pass from the hammer that you hit through the string, through the air, through your ear cartilage, into your brain. And I just skipped about a million steps too. This is even a vast simplification, what I'm saying. But ultimately through all these different media and all these different shapes of wave pulses that are going, what will be preserved all the way from the string to your brain will be this number, 256. And if it's middle C, if it's a C an octave up, for those of you who know what that means, you know, if you, if you travel up and you find the same key that looks the same as that original white key, but it's like, it, you know, it, and it's also called C, but it sounds a little bit higher. Why it sounds higher, but it has the same name is because it's an integer multiple of the first one. I'm, so like the uh, C an octave up is 512 Hertz or A, the middle A in the piano is 440 hertz, and an octave up is 880 hertz. I am not asking you to memorize all these numbers or anything like that. I'm not asking you to take all, and I'm not assuming, I mean, I'm assuming that you're all at different comfort levels with musical instruments, but what I want you to get is this. If someone presses the key on the piano and it's like not in tune, if it's enough out of tune, most of you would know something was wrong. Like, or let me get more specific. I, maybe you don't know anything about a piano, but you all know the music that you like, right? And picture right now in your mind, picture like your favorite contemporary song. That's just a silly thing to say, but like picture a song you really like, right? And picture going into a karaoke bar and some dude or some chick gets up to the microphone to sing the song that you really like that maybe you were going to sing that night. I don't know. And they go up to sing the song that you know and you like, and they start singing it in the karaoke bar. Just bear with me for a second, right? I know that you know, if you've got a song that you like, if it has any lyrics to it at all, um, if a person gets up to do karaoke and then they're singing it, if they hit the wrong note at the wrong time. I know that all of you know it. I mean, if it's your favorite song, you know what it's supposed to sound like. Even if you don't know anything about music theory, even if you've never played an instrument, even if you don't know what I'm talking about when I say C or D or E or whatever, you know it when someone blows musically a pitch that you're expecting, right? I mean, if they blow it badly enough, you'd be like, oh, like, dude, please, right? Well, what does it mean if they blow the pitch, if they sing the wrong note? If they sing something too flat, too low, when you were expecting a certain note, it means that their vibration number was lower than it should have been. If you were supposed to be hearing a middle C, no matter what you think it's called, or 
like if you were supposed to be hearing a middle C, your ear was supposed to be vibrating at 256 times. And if they go too flat or too low, that means your ear and ultimately the electrical signal in your brain vibrated at a number that was too low compared to 256. All I'm, oh, I'm going to look at the chat. There's things happening in the chat. Awesome. I'm going to look in one second. I'm do, all I'm trying to say right now is that pitches are numbers and the numbers are specifically the wave frequency. That's the only thing I'm trying to get across, but it's like literal. It's like literal. Like the, when a note is correct, that means the number was correct. And when a note is off, if it's off enough, you notice it. It might be off only slightly and you might not notice it, but if it's off slightly, that means the number is off. What number? The frequency number. That's all I'm trying to get across right now about sound waves. I'm gonna, but I see there's things happening in the chat, so I'm excited. So I'm gonna look. Okay, wait, wait. Okay, so we're not. Oh, so to be correct. Oh, and this is to everybody. Okay, so we're gonna. Oh, oh, okay, okay, okay. It's not off topic. I mean, yes. If I'm not careful, I could go down the rabbit hole of this, I and mean, of course, we should have a whole course on this. But, I mean, Ashton's question, like, would it be correct to? No, no, cool, cool. And look, I mean. I love music too. And I mean, if nothing else, please know that underlying all that makes sense about music is math and physics. For show, sure. like directly. So yet, yeah, number one, if you play a chord, yes. If you play three notes, for example, at the, th at the same time, well, first of all, just remember, if you play a chord, right, this is to everybody. I mean, a chord means playing usually three, but technically a chord is more than one note at the same time. That's what Ashton's talking about. And of course you hear chords all the time, right? I mean, I mean, almost anytime someone's playing a piano, they're almost not just, I mean, you know what I'm saying, you're here. And then also whatever band you listen to or whatever music you listen to, of course, even if someone's just diddling around on the piano and they're not literally hitting more than one note, of course that's happening at the same time that someone's on the bass guitar and someone's on the guitar. So you're almost always hearing chords, right? When you hear me or and then someone's singing. So you're almost always hearing a bunch of notes simultaneously. And that's what Ashton's asking about. Um, 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 and yes, whenever you hear more than one note at the same time, you're hearing a very complicated mathematical sum of frequencies. You're hearing a bunch of graphs happen at the same time, all superimposed on one another. Yes, you are hearing the sum of all frequencies. Now, the sums start getting very complicated. Like the math does start getting complicated, but absolutely. I mean, just like adding two graphs together is like more than, it's a slightly involved process that's more than just adding two numbers together. But oh yes, I mean, the simple answer to Ashton's question is yes. Let me remind you all that it's not an off topic question. The mere fact that you can hear two notes at the same time, remember that's already a bizarre property that is exhibited only by waves. Like you can't have two baseballs in the same place at the same time. If I have one baseball here and I throw another baseball at it, the first baseball gets knocked out of the way. Like duh, like duh, we all know that. But that's a complete, that that's something that particles demonstrate you get so used to it you think everything is like that now, i don't know what you think but i think like oh yeah of course you can't have two baseballs at the same place at the same time but and you can't you can't have two particles in the same place at the same time but you absolutely can have two waves at the same place at the same time i.e at your ear if you couldn't music would be meaningless in fact almost all communication would be meaningless so it, i mean that, that is an interesting and yes, it's all mathematical. Okay, we say, um, okay. Oh, sorry, sorry, Sulady. I'm, I'm just like yammering. Sorry, Sulady, go. Or is that a question? Or were you just raising your hand from before? Wait, Sulady, do you have a... Oh, wait, we can't... Oh, you might be talking. I think you're off mute, but we're not hearing you. Wait, or did she leave? Wait, what just happened to... Oh, Sulady, are you... Wait, no... Oh, no, okay. No problem. Okay. Okay. I was so excited. Okay. Um, all right. So, 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 so first of all, oh, that's fine. That's fine. Okay. First of all, then, um, takeaway for the moment. Uh, sound wave frequencies are sound pitches. That's point number one. Point number two now. I'm saying that if we, if I send a sound to you through the air, but one of us is moving through the air, 
or, or past the air or whatever, if one of us is not stationary relative to the air, then the frequency that I measure is not the frequency that you will measure. The frequency that I send will not be the frequency that you receive. So the Doppler effect in that you're all familiar with from living in the city, the Doppler effect is that whole thing of, eh, that's the Doppler effect, right? Eh, I, that, well, that's an example of the Doppler effect, but that's an example of, of a car or a motorcycle or something coming toward you and then going and then passing you and going away from you. We're going to run number. I, we have to do at least one example of this and crunch the numbers. And I'm going to tell you right now too, I'm going to try to make this not go for two and a half hours, but, but I'm going to tell you in advance, if it does, my apologies, but it's not a digression. It is the course material. And it, there's always one big Doppler effect problem on the final exam because the Doppler effect like ties the whole universe together. So I'm just, for whatever it's worth, I'm going to try to do this quickly, but we, we do have to get it one way or the other. So bear with me. Oh, wait, wait, so you hear it every Monday. Okay. Oh, oh, and there's more in the chat. Wait, so if, if the wave you send isn't it? Right. If the wave. That's so funny. Okay, wait, I'm just going in order of the chat. Um, If the wave you send isn't the wave, sorry, sorry, Remy's thing. If the wave you send isn't the same as the wave received, how does a radar gun work? That And if by Remy, by Remy, if, if by radar gun, Remy means like a police radar gun that's like measuring the speed of a car, which I think is what he means. It works exactly by this principle. This is what I'm going to show. I mean, it's a great question. This is what I'm going to show you today is that, is that the faster something is going relative to something else when a wave is exchanged, the more the wave differs from one thing to another. So we can run that idea backwards and we can ultimately say, if if I receive a frequency that's different from the one sent, I can tell how fast something is moving. Then, it, I mean, I'll get to, I mean, we're going to run the numbers. I'm going to show you. But if I understand Remy's question correctly, it's precisely actually the point. In fact, he, um, do, 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 do. I mean, just to establish, also just to establish that Remy's question is a good one and also to establish like why we're going to spend, a, why I'm making a big deal of this Doppler effect. That idea that you can tell how fast something is moving toward you or away from you by the effect on the wave frequencies, like in other words, running the Doppler effect in reverse is ultimately how and why we believe that stars are moving away from us from planet Earth. It's ultimately why we come to believe that the universe is spreading out because of a Doppler effect that we ultimately measure and study regarding the information coming to us from stars. That So I got to show you how this works, but that's exactly the point is that the Doppler effect, the frequency difference uh, between a source and a receiver reveals something about the motion between the source and the receiver. So, um, and we hear it every Monday. Yeah, I assume by every Monday you mean, but oh, wait, yeah. Oh, the ambient, oh yeah, God, especially during COVID. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, so, so I'm gonna finish giving you the qualitative thing and then we're gonna run, well, actually, no, let me set it up so I stay on track. I'm going to set up the situation. I'm going to set up the situation.
sorry, I'm not sure. I just keep running out of room. Hold on a second. Okay, so here's a scenario. Oh, one other thing too, sorry. Okay, here's case one, what I'm gonna call case one of the Doppler effect. Uh, uh, let me, okay, case one of four. I'll make that clear. Case one of four. I say there's four, there's four standard basic possible cases of the Doppler effect. The four cases would be, and I don't care what, you know, what, how you number them or how you call them. But when I say there's four possible basic cases of the Doppler effect, what I mean is a receiver could approach a source or a receiver could recede from a source, or a source could approach a receiver, or a source could move away from receiver. Those are the four basic cases, okay? And it's actually, it's important and incumbent upon us to evaluate at least two of the cases and compare the results. That's sort of our goal here, however long it takes. What I'm gonna look at here first is case one, where the receiver is approaching the source, okay? Um, now, uh, now there's a bunch of givens here. One big given is the velocity of the wave relative to the medium, VWM, the velocity of the wave relative to the medium is being given as 340 meters per second. What is that? that now that's a real number. Um, that's a very real number. And it is a number that we really do know even before this particular artificial problem starts. This is the speed of sound relative to air, in air at standard temperature and pressure. This is the speed at which sound propagates through a medium known as air. And please remember one of the big takeaways that we got like weeks ago, you know, before break and all that, one reason that we study waves, one reason that we care about waves, one thing we found out about waves weeks ago is that a wave travels at a given fixed constant speed relative to its medium. That is actually a very exciting and bizarre fundamental property of waves. Unlike particles, when you remember a wave is a vibe is a is a um is a collection of many, many particles all oscillating in a very particular all oscillating harmonically in time while they're all spread out harmonically in space, right? right? Again, this is from weeks ago. But the whole idea is that wave pulses propagate due to the individual, the, the vast number of individual oscillations of each one of those particles creating the pulse. And each particle oscillates at a frequency that is determined by the material properties of that oscillator. Remember, each oscillator vibrates at an omega, which is like the, always like the square root of K over M or, or something like that, depending on what kind of material it is. In other words, once you know what the oscillator is made of, it can oscillate at only one given rate. 
that is not dependent on amplitude. We made a huge deal of that, like in the first couple of months or weeks of this course. So each oscillator oscillates at or each air molecule in this case, vibrates back and forth at a rate that we can do nothing about. Once we say it's air at a standard temperature and pressure, each air molecule just does its thing. And no matter how far back you try to pull an air molecule or whatever you do to its amplitude, it still just does its thing, right? And so then each air molecule is doing its thing at a certain rate, doing its thing at a certain rate, doing its thing. And then that all of those collective oscillations together create this pulse that propagates through the air molecules. That pulse is going to go at a speed that is fixed and determined and constant due entirely to whatever it is, the material that it's propagating through. In other words, the air molecules. So, so if I make a sound right now, I don't care what I do. I don't care if I try to make a really loud sound or a really quiet sound. I don't care if I'm running toward you or running away from you when I make that sound. The minute the sound comes out of my mouth, it starts propagating through the air at a given fixed speed relative to that air. The number, we know it, the number in the case of sound in air is approximately 340 meters per second, which is a little bit lower than a thousand miles an hour. It's pretty fast, but it's not ridiculously fast. I mean, like, you know, we make airplanes that go faster than it. We make cars that go faster than it, believe it or not. But but it is it is what it is. Um, air, uh, sound will propagate through air at about a 340 meters per second. And that is relative to the air. Fixed and given. So it's one of the givens in this problem is that V, W, M, V of the, the speed of the wave relative to the medium is 340 meters per second. That's given number one. Okay. Another given, let's just suppose for the sake of this problem, is that we have this speaker that's emanating sound waves. That's what the stupid picture is trying to say. It's like a speaker. Maybe it's in a car, I don't, whatever, but it's a speaker. And it's sending out these wave pulses. And let's just posit that they're going out, that the frequency of the wave relative to the source uh, is, excuse me, let's just posit for the sake of this example that the frequency of the wave relative to the source is 500 hertz. That's a little bit higher than middle A on a piano for those of you tracking this at home. But it, in other words, it's a realistic number. That is a realistic appropriate frequency for an everyday kind of sound that you would find in the middle of a piano keyboard. So let's assume that what the source measures as the frequency of its wave is 500 Hertz. Let's further assume the next blue given that the velocity of the source relative to the medium, the velocity or the speed of the source relative to the medium is zero meters per second. What that means in English is we're assuming the speaker is just sitting still relative to the air. It's not moving through the air. It doesn't observe air moving past it. We're, okay. This is all part of case one. The last given I'm giving you is like, let's assume that there's a receiver, an ear. That's supposed to be, a, that stupid picture is supposed to be a picture of an ear to connote that it's receiving the sound wave. Let's assume in this example that the ear is running toward the speaker. I mean, maybe it's on a bike, maybe it's on a motorcycle. And it's running toward the speaker um, at a speed of 40 meters per second. Now I'm intentionally putting the double absolute value signs around the V. I'm trying to make very clear that what I know right now is the amount, the rate at which the ear is running toward the speaker. I'm saying the amount is 40 meters per second. I'm trying to make clear that I don't know if I'm gonna call that a positive number or a negative number yet. Like that's actually up to us to decide when we solve this problem and do the calculations. But as far as the given is concerned, the given number, the given magnitude is 40. And that, that's pretty fast. That's like 85 miles an hour. So that ear must be on some kind of motorcycle or in some car or whatever, but that's, Okay, so basically you have a car, you're in a car driving toward some sound system or some other car and you're driving toward it while you listen uh, to the sound that it's making. Now, what, I'm, what we're gonna solve for mathematically here is we're gonna solve, and this is always the case in any Doppler effect problem, we're gonna solve for the frequency of the wave as measured by the receiver. What I'm, it's, and I'm asserting I'm asserting that that number is not going to be 500 hertz. 
In fact, I'm going to go further and tell you right now, I'm going to predict, we're going to do the calculation. We're going to get a number. I don't think we're going to get 500. We would get 500 if the ear were just sitting still, but it's not. It's moving toward the, uh, the speaker. I'm going to go further and tell you, I'm going to go further and tell you that I believe we're going to get a number, even before I do the calculations, I believe we're going to get a number that is, well, actually, well, I'm going to ask you. Oh, yeah, let's pause for a second. Do you believe, like, I'm not asking you to do any formulas or equations or anything. Just think about this physically. Maybe even imagine that instead of sound waves, maybe imagine that you're running toward ocean waves at Coney Island or at Far Rockaway or whatever. Imagine that you're at the beach and some big barge is sending ripples toward you, toward the shore. And imagine that you're running toward them. My question to all of you, to any of you, and I'm going to ask you to put answers in the direct chat, and I'm going to wait till I get like two or three of them. I'm going to, if you run toward waves that are being formed by, that are being transmitted by some source, if you run toward them, do you think that you would encounter them more frequently or less frequently than they're being sent out? What I'm asking that I want to know in the chat is, do, what I'm in effect asking, if you look at this example we're doing here, we're going to solve for FWR. My, que my question is, hold on, I'll write it on the thing. My question to all of you, before we do the numbers, I'm asserting that FWR will not equal FWS. That's the whole point of a Doppler effect is that the source and the receiver will not agree. They will get two different measurements on the frequency of this wave. My question that I want you to predict in the chat is, do you believe the received frequency will be higher or lower than the source frequency? And, I, and I'm asking you, I, you can, I think you can make this prediction without crunching numbers. I think if you just picture the phenomenon and the sort of logic of the phenomenon, I believe that ear is going to encounter those wave fronts either more frequently or less frequently than they're being sent out just by virtue of this picture. So I'm going to pause for a second. Well, first of all, can you just raise your hand if the question is clear? Even if you're not, could you just raise your hand if you're hearing that I'm asking you a question? Okay, that, thank you, Ashton. Thank you, uh, Marina. Thank you, Remy. Also, thank you. That's three. I'm a little, okay, I think Jake made a, uh, yeah, okay, yeah, okay, he did, okay. And thank you, so, okay, thank you. And thank you, so lady. Um. Okay, so now in the private chat, I mean, in the, that's not so weird. In the direct chat, could you please tell, I'm looking for an answer of either lower or higher. Those are the choices. I'm going to pause for a second. Oh, cool. I'm getting one answer already. I'm totally, I'm not going to say whether they're right or wrong, but I'm totally getting an answer that totally does answer the question. Thank you. I've got one. Oh, cool, cool, cool. Cool, cool. I got it. Cool, cool, cool. I did. Oh, and someone put in the drawer. Okay. I've got, I'm not going to say whether right. Oh, state of that. Oh, weird. Okay. I forgot about, okay, fair enough. So no, that's great. So there's one answer in the everyone chat. I'm not saying if it's right or wrong. So you this shouldn't discourage anybody from putting whatever they want. Um, and I'm going to wait. Okay, now I've got like four answers. Awesome, awesome. Okay, I got Remy's answer and like four other, oh, five other answers. Wait, I'm going to, that's great. I'm going to say right now that every single, oh yeah, go straight to, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, right, 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 right. That's right. Um. Sorry about that. I hate the Yabber board. I mean, I love it. I love it. But okay, guess what? Every, oh, that's like seven answers in the chat. And every single person put the same answer. I don't think that's ever happened before in a class. And every single person put the same answer. And it's, and I agree with the answer. It's right. I'm actually so, oh, you should all submit for participation. You're all going straight to heaven. I mean, science heaven. I mean, graduate school, whatever. Um, yes, that's awesome. Every one of you who put an answer in said higher, said FWR is higher, should be higher than FWS. And I am so pleased. You're totally with me. I completely agree. Yeah, because you're running into the waves. I mean, it's. The, I think that's what you're all telling me. And some people did explain it and some people didn't. But yes, like you're running into the waves. So you're going to encounter them more frequently than if you just stood there. And if you ran away from them, you'd encounter them less frequently. I totally agree. It's that 
qualitatively, it's exactly logical, I hope, I think. So we're going to expect that the number we're going to get for FWR is going to be something greater than 500. Now, all there is to do is to do the math. I'm going to show you how to do it. But so we're all on the same page, I think. Um, here's what I need to set. Up. I'm going to show you a procedure for doing this. I'm going to set up the logic for this. Okay, just a reminder, so you, you know, first of all, for all waves, the speed of a wave is a wavelength. Um, it is the wavelength times the frequency, right? The, the distance from one cycle to the next times the number of cycles per unit of time. So in other words, meters per second equals meters per second. I can't really say it. I'm sure I could say it better than that. But um, so, so I mean, it, if, if, if you're standing at Coney Island and there's like waves coming in, if there's two waves coming in every second and there's three meters between every two waves and, and there's three meters from one wave to the next and they're coming in two per second, then, then there's a total of six meters every second. I, there's got to be a better way to say that, but that's the fact. Um, we said the speed of, a, and the speed of a wave is always fixed. So if, if, the, if the wavelength gets, the speed of a wave is always fixed. So if you make waves more frequently, you automatically make smaller waves. If F goes up, lambda goes down because V is fixed. Fixed to what? Fixed to the medium. In other words, the speed of a wave relative to the medium equals the wavelength of the wave relative to the medium times the frequency of the wave relative to the medium. Now, why do I have to be so picky? And keep put. Why do I have to be so picky and keep on saying this? And why do I have to put two subscripts after everything? Like, what's going on with these two subscripts? What's going on with these two subscripts is that what I just wrote down was true universally about all waves. But let's not forget that even before we get to waves, there's something true universally about all speeds. In general, speed velocity is a relation between two objects, velocity is never a property of one object. Velocity, in other words, is relative always in physics. It never makes any sense to say, how fast is that object? It only makes sense to say, how fast is that object relative to the ground or relative to the lab or relative to me? or relative to the earth, right? It, velocity is always a comparison of one object to another. And if you change the base of comparison, you change the velocity, right? 
That's called Galileo's principle of relativity. It's why we can, in one side of our brain, believe that the ground is stable and that we are not moving at all relative to the ground or that the ground is not moving at all relative to us. We're just standing still on the ground, feeling totally stationary and stable. And yet in another part of our brain, we can accept as third graders making solar system projects, we can accept and believe that the earth is evidently moving past the sun all the time at a speed of approximately 65,000 miles per hour. Like I'm not, I am trying to be dramatic, but remember part of your brain believes that the earth is still and part of your brain believes that the earth is moving through space at 65,000 miles per hour. How can that be? Because velocity is a relation to, to the earth, you are still. To the sun, you are moving 65,000 miles an hour. And that's not a contradiction. And one of you isn't right and the other wrong. It's a matter of perspective, right? So let me put that mathematically. Let me remind you of the mathematical implications of that. I'm saying, I'm sorry. Um, right. So two, for all velocities, For all velocities, Galileo's principle of relativity. Hello, what just happened? Hello, why am I? I don't know why it just got darker. Pardon me. Okay. Okay, you, you may or may not have seen this before, like in Physics 101, but let me remind you or clarify to you, if you, the, the, the velocity is relative, is what I'm saying here. Velocity is a relation between two objects, always. It is never just a property of one object. Therefore, anytime we're being careful about velocities, anytime we're talking about velocities in any careful way, we really always have to put two subscripts on a V, uh, to make it clear what we're comparing to what. Um, uh, if A, B, and C are three arbitrary objects, okay, then, then in the one object case, when you just have one object, object A, Object, if you just say, what's the velocity of object A? And someone says, well, relative to what? And you say, well, relative to nothing, just like relative to A. I mean, I'm just looking at object A. I'm just looking at this one object. I just want to know how fast it is. And so my, and again, a physicist will go, well, compared to which other object? And you go, no, not compared to another object, just by itself. How fast is object A going? If you think about it, if you have nothing to compare object A to, if you're just comparing the velocity of object A to itself, i.e. the velocity of A relative to A, you will get zero every time, right? Nothing is ever moving relative to itself. This is like first person view in a video game or whatever, right? My, my nose is never moving according to me. It is always two inches from my eyes or whatever, or seven inches in my case, but right? Like you don't move relative to yourself. The earth doesn't move relative to itself. The velocity of any one object relative to itself is always zero. That's the one object case of relativity. The two object case is, okay, now if we have earth and sun, the velocity of the earth relative to the sun is necessarily always 
the opposite of the velocity of the sun relative to the earth, right? I mean, if we believe this, if we see the sun going past us from east to west at 65,000 miles an hour, then the sun sees us moving at 65,000 miles an hour from west to east. And we're both right. Neither one of us is more right than the other. It's a question of frame of reference. It's a question of what's the base of comparison, right? So in the two object case of relativity, what we're saying is velocity is a relation and it's a symmetric relation. I go past you at the opposite of the velocity that you go past me. That's premise number two, VAB equals negative of VBA. Premise number three, very, and all this, I'm not just being arbitrary, or we need all this for the Doppler effect. And all this is just true in general about velocities. But the last one says, what if you have three objects? Then velocities add in a very specific, interesting way. It, it looks arbitrary, but you use this in your life all the time. The velocity of A relative to C is always equal to the velocity of A relative to B plus the velocity of B relative to C. What do I mean by that? I mean, the velocity of me relative to a subway plus the velocity of the subway relative to 8th Avenue yields the velocity of me relative to 8th Avenue. That's why I take subways, right? In other words, I can be standing on the subway or, or sitting, but of course I would always give my seat to you. I would stand if you were there. But anyway, I could be standing on a subway going zero miles an hour relative to the subway. But if the subway is going 80 miles an hour relative to 8th Avenue, then I go 80 miles an hour relative to 8th Avenue. Like, duh, right? But you know it goes, right? I mean, we all know that. But it, you also know that it works even when you don't have zeros and even when you have negative signs. For, like, you know that if the escalator in Columbus Circle is going down at 20 miles an hour and you are in the, and you're in a rush, and there's all these tourists like clogging up the thing, probably on the left side if they're tourists, but whatever. If they're, if they're, let's assume they're good tourists, all on the right side of the of escalator, and they're clogging it up, and you're in a rush. So the escalator is going 20 miles an hour relative to the station. If you start running down that subway at two, I mean, running down that escalator at two miles an hour relative to the escalator, you know you're now going 12 miles an hour relative to the station. Like your velocities add, right? That's why you bother to run because you, you'll get your velocity relative to the escalator plus the velocity of the escalator relative to the station. So you move faster than the people on the right, like duh. But you also know that if you are my eight-year-old son, you're likely to run up that down escalator. And you know... And if you run up the down escalator, it's now like a negative plus a positive. And someone watching from the outside, if my, you know what I'm getting at. Like even the negative signs count. If my, and my son used to do this when he was like four, he would like try to, to run up at the same speed as the thing was going down so that some onlooker watching him would see like the wild coyote phenomenon. Like they'd see his legs moving, but him not getting anywhere relative to the station. You know what I'm saying? I'm babbling now, but my point is velocities add as long as you match the frames of reference appropriately. The velocity of me relative, and I see there's something in the chat. I'm going to shut up in a second and get to the chat, but I just want to make sure this third equation, we totally need it for the Doppler effect. So I want to make sure you're clear on it. Velocity of me relative to a train plus velocity of the train relative to the street equals velocity of me relative to the street. And all of those velocities are correct. It's all about frame of reference. This is just, that's the three object case of the relativity of velocities. We're gonna take this, I'm gonna shut up. I'm gonna look in the chat. But I just, what I want to establish mathematically, this is the only math we need, but we need this math. The Doppler effect is something that, occur, that, that takes into account the relativistic nature of velocities and applies it to the constant velocity character of waves. That's what we're going to do in a moment. Like, okay, I'm going to shut up and look in the chat. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Oh, 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 sorry. Oh, oh, okay, okay. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm sorry, sorry. Uh, I don't know if the person's already going. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Absolutely. Sorry. Um. Yeah. No. There's no consequence. No, no, no. Thank you. Uh, sorry. Uh, direct chat. Uh, 
Absolutely. Thank you for telling me. And thank you for waiting for me to respond. That's very considerate of you. But totally, I get it. Direct chat person. I mean, and I'm sorry also. Uh, I mean, my, yeah, but please do what you got to do. And yes, watch the video, but thank you. Um, well, okay. I don't mean to, okay. Um, no, least, I, yes, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, I, I know this is a lot, but one of the reasons, again, the Doppler effect is a huge, important phenomenon that actually allows us to understand the motion of the universe. Um, and the Doppler effect is a wave phenomenon that relies on the relativistic character of velocity or the relational character of velocity. So the two bits of math that we need to do the Doppler effect are one, the equation for speed of a wave and two, the equation that reminds us how speed works in general. That I'm gonna put those two things together now to solve, to get the numbers that match your prediction about what happens in this Doppler effect. Are, 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 um, are people still with me? Okay, thank you. All right, that's good enough for me. Thank you for that facial contact. Okay, oh, cool, cool, thank you. And uh, also I'll tell you now, I am watching the time. What, what I'm gonna do now, I'm gonna give you a method a three plank method for solving a Doppler effect for any case. I'm gonna do it for you now. Then I'm gonna ask you guys, I mean, regardless of what time it is, I'm gonna do this case. Then I'm gonna ask you I'm gonna, to do a different case and we're gonna compare answers and then we'll be done. I mean, the you know, the quicker we do it, the more we get onto the other material. But the goal here is that I do one case then you follow my exact method, like in breakout rooms, you're gonna follow my exact method. You're gonna not even think you're gonna, I mean, you are, whatever, I'm gonna do this. You're hopefully gonna take notes. I'm gonna get an answer. Then you're gonna follow my exact method for one other case. We'll compare the results and we'll be done with that. Um, but so here is the method. And remember, again, stop me at any point, but remember when I say method, I mean for solving the problem, what does it mean to solve the problem? It means solve for the received frequency. We're all predicting that it's going to be some number greater than 500. We're going to get the exact number by this method. So here we go. Okay, so I'm about to give you, for any Doppler effect problem, any case, there's a three-step method that works every time and that works every time, no matter what the case is. It's a three-step method, just to be clear, because it sometimes confuses people. I still believe in the general five-step problem-solving method that we have for general physics for, in, for any kind of problem, but there's specific rules you can follow to nail a Doppler effect problem. So I'm saying if you were to do this problem, like on the final exam, for example, right? You would do your general five-step problem solving method. Like you would write down the diagram and fact pattern as we just did two pages ago. Then you would write out what the question is as I keep doing in red, right? And then when you get to step three, 
and four of the general method, you would incorporate these three specific Doppler effect steps to make that clear. I'm calling them planks instead of steps. I mean, I'm being a little silly. You can call them whatever you want, but I'm calling these little planks. So, you know, this still fits into the general problem solving method of physics, but here we go. Plank one for any dot. Oh, and I see there's something in the chat. I'll get it in one second. Let me just say this. For any Doppler effect problem, the first thing you always do, regardless of the case, is you solve for the wavelength of the wave according to the source. That's never a given. That's what you solve for. Um, that's what we do first. And I'm going to show you how. And you always do it the same way. What's it, what's it? Oh, oh, sorry. Oh, okay. So Remy, yeah. So you solve for, oh, oh, that symbol, that symbol, sorry, is a lambda. That blue thing before the WS is a lambda. And that means wave, I, sorry, I thought we, I, don't, I thought we'd introduced that. It's a, but that's a lambda. That's the Greek letter lambda. And it means wavelength. And just let me know if, if I'm answering your question. If uh, um, Did I not? Well, anyway, that thing means wavelength. So we're going to solve for the wavelength of the wave as measured by the source. That's what we always do first. And the reason, well, you'll see why we do that first. And here's how. First, we say every single time, we say, well, the speed of the wave, the speed of a wave, according to anything, equals the wavelength of the wave, according to anything, times the frequency of the wave according to anything. In other words, I'm matching all my subscripts. I'm saying, I want to know the wavelength of this wave according to the source. So I'm so I'm going to look at the wave according to the source. I'm applying V, v equals lambda f. I'm just being consistent and doing V equals lambda f at the source. In other words, we've got, in other words, I'm using one of the two equations that I just established like two pages ago, okay? And then I'm rearranging it. So I want the wavelength of the wave according to the source. That's going to be the wavelength of, that's going to be the speed of the wave according to the source over. In other words, I'm just using all my, these normal equations, but everything I'm writing out has two subscripts on it because I'm respecting and paying close attention to the relational character of motion. So I'm, so I'm writing out with two subscripts. So the wavelength equals speed over frequency. Now here's where we have to be really careful. Wait, and by, by the way, Remy, did I answer your question or I just making sure, or let me know if I, or if I should still say, well, okay. Um, and yes, I'm good. Oh, okay, thank you. Oh, and thanks for the voice. Oh yeah, submit for points for the voice. I love the voice. Okay. That sounds weird, but I do. Okay, Um, so I'm doing, um. Lambda equals V over F. Again, the subscripts can start looking intimidating. If at any given moment, if you're trying to look at an equation, you can ignore the subscripts for a moment just to see if you understand the equation. But the reason I'm tracking the subscripts is, is that it comes up right now. Like, like Lambda equals V over F. If I'm not careful, what I might just do is go, is go like, oh, I, I see the V. The V was given in the problem. It's 340. I'll just plug that in. And oh, and F is 500. Plug that in. Well, that's ultimately sort of true. But strictly speaking, we were never strictly or explicitly told the velocity of the wave relative to the source. It, it might seem obvious to you, and you might even be right in thinking that. It's not hard to figure out, but I want to be clear that we were not told it. The thing we know going into the problem, the given, is the velocity of the wave relative to the medium. Because that's all that can be known universally about a wave is how fast it goes through its medium. I'm sorry, so lady, question. Hi. Um, I know you said not to worry about the subscripts, but I do have a, a question. So WS just means wave uh, wave measured by the source? 
Right. No, yeah, yeah, very good. Yes. It means wave relative to the source. And and I don't mean to say don't okay. worry. No, do worry about them. We are totally worried about them. I just meant if at any given moment they're so intimidating that you can't even re- like see what equation I'm talking about. Like mm-hmm. for a moment, you can rewrite the equation without the subscripts just to see like what algebra I did or something. But no, you're right. Yes, th- we do care about the subscripts and we care about it so much that here's what I'm saying right now. Like the velocity of a wave can only be given and known and fixed relative to its medium. We were not explicitly told what the velocity of the wave is relative to the source. We have to figure it out in this step, uh, uh, particularly so that we can do a method that's always workable. So what we say in this step is, we think about the Galileo thing. We say, okay, the velocity of the wave relative to the source it wasn't told to us, but the velocity of the wave relative to the medium was, couldn't we say the velocity of the wave relative to the source is equal to the velocity of the wave relative to the medium plus the velocity of the medium relative to the source? I'm just copying, like I'm just substituting M, S, and W for the A, B, and C that's on the prior page. I'm, oh, cool. Okay, great, great. Awesome, thank you. Um, So I'm saying like, just like the velocity of me relative to subway plus subway relative to street makes me relative to street. Similarly here, I'm saying the velocity of the wave relative to the source will be whatever the velocity of the wave is relative to the air plus whatever the air is doing relative to the source. So I can figure out what the wave is doing to the source, right? And again, I'm writing down a procedure that will work for every single case. You're going to do this exact same procedure in the next case. And I'm warning you right now, you'll really see in the next case why I'm bothering to spell this all out. Because what you might have already realized, okay, is I go, okay, so I'm going to add VWM to VMS. But then I say to myself, hold on, I'm just fixing the chat. Okay. Then I say to myself, velocity of medium relative to source Was that given? No, explicitly speaking, explicitly carefully speaking, no one ever told me the velocity of the air relative to the source. But what they did tell me, if you look at the first diagram, your diagram of this whole thing, what was told is the velocity of the source relative to the medium. Happens to be an easy number in this case. It's not an easy number in every case, but but, but it always is some number in every case. So what I can say is the velocity of the medium relative to the source necessarily always equals the velocity of, uh, excuse me, necessarily always equals the negative of the velocity of, sorry, of the source relative to the medium. Now, in this case, to cut to the chase, of course, I know. Well, here, okay, here, the velocity of the source relative to the medium equals zero. So here in this case, this part of what I'm doing, this step, this plank, I'm saying that we're not done yet. Uh, This is one of those times where I'm doing a lot of work to arrive at a conclusion that you might think is self-evident. Like I'm sure if you're following me at all, you might think I'm making something much more complicated than I need to. Uh, it seems that way. I'm, tr- I'm But bear with me, just hang in. Because what I'm doing is developing a method that will work for all cases, even no matter, so you won't have to change the method at all. So what's happening here in English, I'm saying, I'm saying, to, to, to now read this backwards. I'm saying, look, the velocity of the wave relative to the source in this case, sure, is just 340. It is 340. It's that number that was given, but why? Because the velocity of the wave relative to the air is 340. 
and the air is not doing anything interesting to the source. And therefore the source is not doing any, excuse me, the source is not doing anything interesting in the air. The source is standing still in the air. Therefore the air is standing still relative to the source. Therefore the source observes the sound to do the very same thing that the air observes. So the wave, so the speed of the wave relative to the source is indeed here, 340 plus zero, which equals 340. I just did a lot of work to add a zero to 340 to get 340. I want to emphasize again, that is not a waste of our time to have done that. If you step back and you, I'm saying that in the end of the day, the wave is traveling according to the source, the wave is traveling at the same speed that, that the air thinks it is. That is true in this case. I, but I did all that so I could get V. It's not true in all cases. The, I did all that. It won't be true in the case that you're going to do when we're done, for example. Um, so I did all that to get that VWS. E, oh, sorry. Sorry. To get, I did all that to get that VWS equals 340. Now I can plug in. Now I properly have a number for VWS, which was not explicitly given. What do I do with that? I go back and plug in the thing I was saying. Therefore, lambda ws, we said, was v w, in other words, all this, here's, Okay, now, what I'm saying so far, I've not finished the problem. What I have finished is plank A. Hot, it doesn't get any harder than this, but we're not done yet. I just finished plank A. I just obtained, I just computed the wavelength of the wave according to the source. Like my work that I just did helped me determine how far away the crests of the sound wave are as measured by the source. And that's the way I'm gonna start every one of these problems is first I'm gonna get the wavelength of the wave according to the source. Now, why? There's two reasons I always start this way. Reason number one is because I can, because I'm always given all this information about the source. I'm always given more information about the source than anything else. For example, I'm given the frequency according to the source. So I was able to plug it in. So number one, I did this because I can, but number two, more specifically, I do this because I can now move on to plank number B, plank. Plank number two, I think I'm calling them one and two. So that just leaves, yeah, plank, okay. Plank two is very straightforward and simple. I write down, I note, always, sorry, always, always the wavelength of the wave according to the source will be equal to the wavelength of the wave according to the receiver or vice versa, whichever way you want to write it. I'm just writing that down. That's the whole plank. This is the second reason. That, I just lost my board. I'll get it back in a second. This is the second reason that I solve for wavelength first because wavelength is the one and only property of the wave that both the source and the receiver will agree on no matter what motion is going on. In other words, the reason I solve for the wavelength first is that once I know how far apart these crests are, I don't care how fast the other guy is moving through them or how fast I'm moving through them. If I see that there's 0.68 meters apart, 0.680 meters apart, then the receiver is going to see them as 0.68, is going to measure them as 0.68 Oh, meters apart, no matter what, even if he's running into them and encountering them more quickly, he's still encountering them as, as far apart from one another as I do. It's the one invariant uh, between the two frames of reference. 
So plank two is just to say, okay, whatever you got for the wavelength at the source, you can trust that that will be true according to the receiver as well. That's plank two. So now plank three, we go to the receiver. We analyze from the perspective, from the frame of reference of the receiver. Plank three. Oh, you don't see my board. I'm sorry. I didn't even realize. Hold on. Sorry. Okay. Okay, so here's what we're gonna do in plank three. We, we All the work we just did in plank one, we're gonna literally reverse that work. We're gonna do the same thing backwards for plank three. You know, what I mean by that is, we used the frequency according to the source and the speed according to the source in order to find the wavelength according to the source. Now that we've got, and then we said, oh, that wavelength according to the source, it's the same according to the receiver. So now we go over to the receiver and we say, we've got the wavelength according to the receiver because that's the one thing that everybody agrees on. So we've got the wavelength according to the receiver. We're going to use the speed according to the receiver and the wavelength according to the receiver, and from that, get the frequency according to the receiver. We're gonna use the same equations and just do exactly what we just did backwards in order to finally arrive at frequency, which is what we're looking for. Oh, oh, yes, absolutely. Thank you for asking. Yes, uh, can I though? Wait, yes. To hear, is that, uh, thank you for asking direct time person. Is that what you, So I'm actually, oh, no problem. And I'm glad that somebody just asked me to go back to this page because this page is exactly what we're just going to do backwards now for plank three. Let me say this again. And then we're almost sort of done. Like plank one was we used speed and frequency according to source in order to get wavelength according to source. Plank three is we're going to use speed and wavelength according to receiver to get frequency according to receiver. You might even say, if you're following me, you might even think, well, if you're just going to do the same thing backwards, aren't you just going to get the same frequency again? Like if you're literally, no, because the speeds are different between the uh, source and the receiver. In fact, that's the whole principle of the whole problem. Because speed equals wavelength times frequency. The whole premise of all of this is if the speeds are different, but the wavelength is the same, then the frequencies must be different. That's what's going on here. Since we're in two different reference frames, since we both disagree on the speed of the wave, but we agree on the wavelength on the wave, we're gonna disagree about the frequency of the wave. And that's what I'm about to calculate here. And one last thing again, let me say, if you say, I, I, I don't know why I'm just sitting here arguing with myself in front of you, but, but I will say that again, I'm saying source and receiver, no, let me, I'm saying speed equals wavelength times frequency. Source and receiver disagree about speed, but they agree about wavelength. Therefore, they're gonna disagree about frequency. That's what's going on. One might say, wait, I think I'm following this, but if you're saying that they, you're saying that the source and the receiver disagree about speed of the wave, I thought the speed of a wave is always constant and totally fixed. Good question, if that's what you're thinking. The speed of a wave is always constant and fixed relative to its medium. But the whole premise of the Doppler effect is that either the source or the receiver is moving through the medium, 
therefore observing the medium to move past them. So everybody agrees what sound does through air. But if either you or I are moving through the air, then if I'm moving through the air, then sound is doing something different to me from what it's doing to air and to you. So that's what's so that's what's going on, if that makes any sense. But you'll see in the math now. So we're going to go to plank three. And we're going to reverse the procedure we just did. And we're going to even see why we dragged out that procedure, even though there was like a zero involved and it made it seem silly. Now there's not going to be a zero. And we're going to see. And when I'm going to tell you, well, I'm going to do it. Okay. So, so we go, okay. We go. V, well, hello. We go, okay. V of speed of wave, according to receiver, equals wavelength of wave according to receiver times frequency of wave according to receiver. And we're now, this time we're looking for the frequency of the wave according to the receiver. So that's gonna be VWR divided by lambda WR, like just like we did before, but now we're solving for F instead of solving for lambda. But then I go to the next page. Tell me if you want me to go back, I'm just gonna recopy that. We're saying FWR equals VWR over lambda WR. But then I say to myself, self, I say, wait, VWR is not a given. VWR is not explicitly given. And now here. We don't know VWR and it's not 340. What we know about VWR, VWR necessarily must equal VWM plus VMS. Why am I throwing in the M? Because that's what we know. We know the velocity of the wave relative to the medium. It, that number plus whatever the medium is doing relative to the source will give us what the wave is doing relative to the receiver. Again, everybody agrees that sound is going through the air at 340. But the receiver doesn't think that doesn't measure the air to be still. The receiver is literally experiencing wind, like literally. The receiver is running through the air, therefore the air is running past the receiver. That's relativity. So the receiver observes sound that's trucking through a box of air at 340 relative to that box while the box comes towards him, right? Now, we have to be careful about pluses and minus signs before I go any further. One thing to always do in every Doppler, we want to be sure we're clear and correct about positive and negative signs. So one thing, oh, sorry, there's something in the chat. Is there something? Oh, sorry. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Hold on. I'm good. I was actually, I'm glad someone asked. I was going to be surprised if no one asked. Okay. Tell me when I can. No problem. Thank you. Uh, pleasure doing business. And you should. Do okay, cool. I, I really love, I can't tell you. I, I, it just shows that people are paying. To all right. I'm going to now go all the way back. I want to show you the original diagram. We have to look at the original diagram for a second. In, in terms of pluses and minuses. Yeah, here's the original diagram. One thing we should always do, and you should do, before you start any case of the Doppler effect, we should choose a frame of reference. We should decide what direction is positive for all details and what direction is negative and stay consistent with that. This is still Galileo. Like you can do physics in any frame of reference you want, but you need to stay in that frame of reference and know what the frame of reference is. So my advice, so I could, I can make the one direction positive or the other. And as long as I stick with it, it'll be okay. But my advice, strong, strong advice to everybody is, Right from the get-go, before you do anything complicated with pluses and minuses, always just decide. My advice, well, hello. My advice is that whichever direction the wave is traveling in, whichever direction the wave is traveling in, call that positive. No matter what else is going on, whatever the wave is doing, call that positive. 
That means that every time we're putting in three, in fact, tacitly, that's what we've been doing, whether we knew it or not. Because every time we put in 340 as the speed of the wave, we as the velocity of the wave, we just put in 340. We didn't put in negative 340. That means we were tacitly assuming that whatever the wave was doing was positive. So let's make, let's realize that and stay consistent with it now. Anything the wave is doing is positive. Anything, any, anything that's going against that direction would be negative. That means like in my calculations, the velocity of that receiver relative to the medium in my calculations has got to be negative because it's going against that. I'm not saying VRM is always a negative number. What I'm saying is, I mean, I mean, like in other cases, it probably won't be or might not be. But I am saying whatever direction the wave goes in, call that positive. Otherwise, you have like every time you're writing 340, you're writing a negative. You need to be writing a negative number. So, OK, that said, here I go. OK. That said, here I go, VWR equals VM, VWM plus VMS. What is VMS? VMS was not explicitly given. But what VMS is, VMS is not explicitly given. But according to relativity, VMS must equal the opposite of VSM, right? Velocity of Earth relative to sun is the opposite of the velocity of sun relative to Earth. And VSM, sorry, sorry, I don't mean, sorry, I'm putting all these S's. I don't mean S's, I'm sorry. I, that's supposed to be an R, I'm sorry. No wonder this is crazy. Hold on, that's supposed to be an R, and this is supposed to be an R. I'm in Plank 3 now. My apologies. How come no one caught that? Where are you people? No, I'm just kidding. Ah, um, okay, VRM is what was given. The velocity of the receiver relative to the medium is what was given. What is that? We, If we looked at the signs in our picture, the receiver is moving in toward the wave. It's moving the opposite direction of the wave. So VRM itself was negative 40 meters per second. Therefore, so we have to be careful about these negative signs, you see. Then VMR, VMR must equal the negative of that, the negative of negative 40. So VMR equals 40 meters per second. In other words, if I'm that receiver who's running toward the speaker, I'm running into the air. Therefore, the air is coming into me. The air is traveling, according to me, at the same direction as the wave. According to me, the receiver, that air is traveling at 40 meters per second positively, like the same direction as the wave, right? So why do I care? Because, okay, therefore, so, and that was all, well, yeah, okay. Therefore, so F W R must equal V. V W M plus V M R over Lambda M R. So we say 340 meters per second plus plus. 40 meters per second. So notice like this, all this work that we did in Planck one, it seemed kind of stupid because one of the numbers was a zero. Notice now it's not a zero. And please also know when you do your own case, when you do a different case of this, what's gonna happen is there won't be a zero in the first Planck and there will be a zero in the other Planck. Like you, I'm not trying to confuse you, but I promise you that none of these steps is um, a waste. Um, so all of that we put over the wavelength that we solved for originally, which was the whole point. So we get 380 meters per second, all over 0. 0.680 meters. And we therefore get
Oh, okay. Yes, I see the chat. Hold on. Let me just. Uh, yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. No problem. No problem. Oh, I think that's what you said. Wait. Let me. Let me know. Yeah. No problem. Okay. And luckily, we're. What time is it? Okay, we're doing good actually. Okay. So. Oh, no problem. Okay, cool. Thank you very much. Okay. So, boom. Okay. Okay. Okay, so here, so here's our answer. First of all, we're done with this case. We got that the frequency of the wave, according to the receiver, is 559 hertz. That is noticeably higher than 500, right? This means if the source was sitting here and playing a, a note, nah, let me start again. The, the source is sitting and playing, making a sound, like blaring on its horn, like one sound. Uh, the receiver is coming into the source. The receiver will measure a higher frequency sound, like, oh, uh, like, wow, that was bad. But you, you right? Um, and just as you all predicted, the received frequency is higher than the source frequency. Now, this is real. This is not an illusion. Like if the receiver had a tape recorder or whatever, an iPhone in, in the car, in the car, and the source had an iPhone or recorder in the car, and they both recorded these sounds, then if they're all done with the experiment and go pump together and stand next to each other and press play on both of their recordings, the two recordings would be different. Like they really are different. It, um, one is correct in one frame of reference and one is correct in the other frame of reference. And if you follow the logic of this, if the receiver were going away at the speed of 40, we would do all the same calculations, but we'd have negative signs in certain places. And what we'd end up getting is that the receiver would receive a frequency that rather than being 59 hertz above 500 would be like 59 hertz below 500, right? And that's why the classic Doppler effect that you experience all the time in the city, something comes toward you, you hear a higher frequency than it's playing, and then something goes away from you, you hear a high, lower frequency than it's hearing. So you hear, uh, right? That, that's the point. It's like, now notice also, this has nothing to do with distance, it has nothing to do with distance, and it has nothing to do with volume. This 100% has to do with Velocity and frequency. I mean, I, I understand that when something gets closer and closer to you, it gets louder. Like that's also true, but that's just true in general. That's not some, that's not a relativistic effect. That's just energy dissipation. Like, so we're not talking about loudness and we're not saying that the farther away something is the lower note or anything like that. We're, we're literally just saying if it's coming toward you at a certain, in other words, while it's coming toward you, if it came toward you at a constant speed, you would hear a constant pitch. It's just a pitch that's different from what the car is hearing. So if something just came toward you at a constant rate, you wouldn't even notice the Doppler effect. Like it's playing, uh, and you're hearing, uh, but you don't think that's interesting because you're not in the car. You just hear what you hear. But then when it passes you, all of a sudden the pitch drops to something substantially lower. Not it drops all the way to what the car heard and then lower than that. You follow me? So you notice the Doppler effect when something passes you, if that makes any sense. You know, okay. What I'm gonna, now, this is a, I'm, I don't know if this is easier or hard or what, or boring or interesting. I mean, but hopefully it's sort of clear. I'm hopefully, we're gonna find out now. What I just analyzed for you, I just did the three plank method for doing one case, the case of, receiver approaching source. I'm going to ask you now 
to do one more to on your own in breakout rooms. We're going to take the same numbers. We're just going to change one feature. Okay, so what you're going to do in a minute, I'm going to change the view here. We're taking the exact same numbers, same basic scenario, but we're just, but we're changing to a different case. We're now going to say that the source is approaching at 40 meters per second relative to air. Okay, the receiver is now sitting still in the air. The source is moving into the air at 40 meters per second. Just like before, I'm going to ask you to predict just like before, I'm going to ask you to predict. I, I, well, I'm even going to say, I'm, well, you should predict whether you think the received frequency is going to be higher or lower than the source frequency. And your, but your ultimate goal is to actually calculate the received frequency. You, well, yeah. You should make a prediction of what you think is going to happen qualitatively. If you think you even can predict what the number is going to be, go ahead and predict it. Like if you think that maybe you could infer something from the other case to this, go for it. But so we, but we, again, I think this was Remy's language before, like, again, we have a coming together case. Like before the receiver was coming in toward the, the source. Now this time the source is coming in toward the receiver. So hopefully you can picture again qualitatively what you think is going to happen. You're going to run the numbers and get an exact answer for FWR. I'm going to, and I'm going to shut up in like one second. I'm going to put you in breakout rooms and I'm going to ask you to solve this problem. I'm asking you to follow the exact same procedure that we just did for the other. Like 
like don't overthink it just trust yourself and just follow the algorithm be careful about positive and negative signs again i'm going to advise that whatever direction the speaker is going in this time is po- i mean i'm i'm going to again advise that whatever direction the wave is going in is positive i'll tell you right now i therefore think that everything in this problem is now going positive i mean that doesn't mean you won't have negative signs but i mean this time i'm saying the source is moving in while it makes that sound. So I think even the direction of the source is positive for whatever that's worth, but you're going to run the exact same procedure as last time. If you are following me at all, I'm going to tell you now that in plank A, I don't think you're going to have a zero in the numerator. If you're careful, you there won't be a zero, but then when you go down to plank three, I think somewhere there will be a zero. If you're, if you don't know what I mean, don't worry about it, just do it. But I'm going to ask you all to, and the, I'll even say, well, yeah, all right. So I'm going to put you in breakout rooms. I'm going to ask you and try your best. What I'm really going to ask though is, uh, if you either, once you're finished, when you have an answer, whether or not you think it's right, when you have an answer, Come back to the main room, please, and let me know because we have a little bit of a time issue. Or if you hit a wall, if you just give up, if you're like, I, I'm totally stuck. Like we we tried for it. I mean, you should try to think a little bit. Don't give up that. But once you really, if you believe you literally hit a wall and you're really done, or you just have a question or whatever, come back to the main room and ask me. But let's not, don't just like drift off, if you know what I mean. All right, so here come the breakout rooms. Um Okay, and some of the breakout rooms will be very small. So just do your, you know, whatever. But please uh, go. And I don't want this to take till 710, please. Okay. Awesome. So the So please go to your breakout room. Okay, thank you, okay. So please go to breakout rooms. You guys okay, Giselle and Sylvia? I'm gonna stop recording.